Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 267, featuring the first in what will probably be a three-part series of interviews with Mr. Tom Hall, formerly of id Software. Now, I'm pretty sure you've heard of id. Uh, they are the company responsible for the Commander Keen, Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, Quake, you get the picture, one of the most influential uh, game studios of all time. And Tom had a major role to play in the founding of that company and the games that, that came out of it. Anyway, we've got a lot of stuff to cover. In the, this first part, we talk about Tom's history, how he got started in the games industry, and then the development of the Commander Keen character and series of games. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Tom Hall. Okay, well, let's uh, shift gears a little bit, Tom, if you don't mind. Uh, what did it start at the beginning? Uh, how did you get? I was. How did you become no. interested in? Oh, go ahead. So I'm just kidding. I was. I was born in Wisconsin, and <laughs> yeah, I'm in Minnesota, so I'm just not too far. Uh, so, how did you get interested in game designs and game programming? Um. Well, I was in. I had all these sort of creative, weird hobbies when I was growing up. So I was a magician for a year or something like that. And then I uh, folded origami for a few years and I toppled dominoes and I made all these crazy ramps and elevators and swings and stuff like that. And I, uh, last thing I had a uh, Empire Strikes Back snow speeder going down fishing line to both turn on a a tape recorder that had the Star Wars theme on it and start the first domino. And then at the end, all these mouse traps flew off with all ping pong balls and everything. It was a spectacle of like 1500 dominoes and stuff. Uh, and, but all those, you know, were just sort of, I'd do this for a year. Oh, that was fun. And then I was doing two hobbies at once. I was I had a Super 8 camera and I was making little tiny films, uh, sort of special effects films because I used to get Cinemagic and Starlog and you know, and because I you know love Star Wars and Star Trek and all that stuff and 2001 and and uh, all sorts of films like that and then I was making a little special effects film so I'd you know see something in Star Trek 2 or something and emulate that or. I'd, do a sort of a chalk animation of the Millennium Falcon going through the asteroid field or something. It was kind of, it was kind of fun and creative and stuff. Um, but then on June 9th, 1980, my dad got an Apple II Plus, and I just lived on that thing, and I just made tons of games. I made like 15 text adventures and lots of little graphic demos. And kind of looking at the two, I knew like the films were just kind of a kid doing little little films and stuff like that. And I knew I'd need sort of a crew and a lot of people to sort of make that a reality right away. Whereas the stuff I was doing on Apple II was kind of close to the stuff that was actually being published. I just needed to get a little better at it. And so that was really empowering and I could just do that all by myself. I sort of like went into programming sort of like a, a medium, just like, you know, writing or some other medium. It was just a way for me to express and so that was really empowering and i and like i just kept making little games and over the years while i was going to college uh, i made like about 50 games uh just little games you know text adventures uh graphics adventures you know little arcade games and stuff like that but i just you know learned my craft like robert rodriguez says uh in his book rebel without a crew make 10 bad movies just make 10 bad movies, don't show them to anybody, just learn your craft. And on the 11th one, maybe you'll do something kind of interesting. And uh, that was my process, too. I just, I made 50 little games, you know, just, and finished them, which is a lot of people, it's difficult to finish a game. Uh, but that taught me a lot about how you make games. And, like, I, I mean, even even though I have absolutely no musical talent, I made a bunch of... Uh, bad songs you know and recorded them from tape recorder to tape recorder just kind of adding a track every time 
but that taught me how you make songs and 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 then without making like you know 20 songs I, and realizing well I won't do that but <laughs> but it taught me how you know you make songs and there's a bridge and you know, there's a chorus and, and uh, how you add kind of layer things and that was an interesting thing to learn how to create that kind of work and so these 50 games taught me how to make games so by the time i joined Softic and stuff disc and stuff i was really good at knocking out a game quickly and understanding what you need to do to get it done soft disc that's a company's yes. whose name you have to be very careful how you pronounce so. yes uh, i made of a <laughs> malaprofits in there but well, uh yeah so I mean, do you have any of these uh, 50 games? Are they sitting around on a, on a floppy disk somewhere? Yeah, uh, like I I need to talk to John. Like he, he got his onto, there's a thing called a super drive, so you can copy your games onto an IBM disk. And while there are still IBM disks existing, uh, I need to get the stuff over on those and then copy those onto like a modern media that we use nowadays. Uh, there's actually emulators that will accept old disk images, so uh, need to do that. Uh, I don't know how many of them are kind of like gone with the ravages of time, but I've kept pretty good. I've kept them inside and so that they have a shot, you know. But, uh, yeah, they're all still around on a disk somewhere. You mentioned that you were making lots of text adventure games. Uh, what were, were you playing them as well? Do you have any, any favorites? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I liked uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy text adventure. Uh, if you're a fan of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, seek out at least references to that because in that text adventure, they actually have the second verse of Vogon poetry. So you get to experience a whole new verse of horrible poetry, uh, the second worst poetry in the universe or whatever. Uh, uh, but uh, that was awesome. The original adventure was awesome. Uh, Zork, which is kind of like around the same kind of uh, idea. Um, just all the Infocom games were so amazing. Uh, they really created sort of a uh, a real sense of place. And it was like a novel you were playing in a way. And uh, one of my favorites was Deadline. Well, Kid Tracker's Guide shipped with a lot of little Joshkis like Pocket Fluff and uh, uh, so on and Peril Sensitive Sunglasses. Uh, uh, Deadline was a murder mystery and you got like the dossier, the whole, like they really cared about what you had in your hand. So you had the dossier and all the things people said and there's like little crime scene evidence and stuff like that. And you actually use that to sort of solve the adventure and, and did everything that you'd want to do as a detective, the little like, oh, you found a, a pad, so you rub a pencil on the pad and something's revealed, you know, like, oh, I don't mean to spoil that text adventure from 1980 or whatever <laughs> but uh but yeah it was uh it was you just really got to do and be that uh detective that you always thought you could be in and you know in and real time try to solve a mystery which is really cool uh you can also by the way on the, the things are coming back on the ipad you can get lost treasures of infocom which of the old Infocom games. So if anyone wants to try out text adventures and have an easier job of typing, uh, that, that's something to get. Were you able to beat any of those games? Or? Oh, yeah. I beat Hitchhiker's Guide. I, I, To my shame, I honestly, I think I'm at 300 out of 365 points on Zork. Uh, just, you know, at the time, got busy. There's a lot of hours in that. Uh, oh, I used to love, love, love Scott Adams' adventures. Not the Scott Adams cartoonist guy, but there is sort of a, a programmer back in the day, uh, Scott Adams, and he made text adventures, and there was like a pirate adventure and a space adventure. And we, my mom and I played this uh, Strange Odyssey space one so much that uh, you, in this one room, you have to touch plastic to turn on this device. And we used to say that to turn on lamps from then on, like for the rest of our life. But uh, we, yeah, we just love those games. And they were there. I mean, they weren't as verbose as as a Zork game because they were like contained in memory and kind of compressed and stuff. But they they really let you go on 
pretty cool adventures and that that was basically what really inspired me to to try to make my own was or those and i i met him at ces and they, you know, it was like meeting a rock star but he was just a geeky guy like all of us and <laughs> but uh but you know he gave me a hint on the adventure i was a little stuck on and I was I like that that meeting was just like wow you know I talked to the guy that made this you know and it's now it's not really a big deal but <laughs> it seems like a big deal at the time to that little kid and was very impactful. You know Scott Adams just released a new text adventure game. Uh, I think I think I I don't know I think I played. I was surprised there was like thirteen like Savage Island Part Three or you know, some something like that and. and I, I started playing it. It was it was just like ridiculously hard and pun. The start of the game was like, wow. <laughs> sort of like come back. Oh, I'll try Scott Adams. Like wow. They're like oh, maybe I'll try that a little bit later. <laughs> so how did you end up at Soft Disk? Um, well, graduated college. I got a, a computer program or computer science degree, systems programming. And I interviewed at Gould and IBM and stuff like that. I did plant trips and everything. They said, and it's weird. They all had said at the end of the interview, we like you. We like your resume. We like your skills. Is this what you really want to do? And I just, you know, came back from all the plant trips. I just sat around and thought about, no, that's really boring. I want to do the fun stuff I've been doing at home and, you know, like I'm passionate about and so I just applied to all these game companies, and they all went no. And uh, then I waited. I waited kind of for the next cycle. Usually, people don't move or leave or something like that, uh, right in December or January. So I waited a couple months. Sent out a whole bunch again. And soft disk. I mean, I had uh, Apple II, you know, thirty thousand lines of Apple II Basic and a ton of Assembler. And that's exactly what they were looking for. Soft Disk was doing a monthly magazine on disk, and that was like, wow, you're super, super, super qualified for for this, and you have some games you could bring with you and publish on or things. So that's awesome. So I kind of basically took a third the pay, but it was a job that I was passionate about that I really loved to do, and that really made a lot of difference, and it really worked out. And it's I've had a fortunate career in that I've gotten to have a creative job and really, you know, sort of express myself and enjoy my job. And a, a lot of people don't have that. So I feel very fortunate. So at what point did you encounter Mr. John Romero? Uh, that was at Softdisk. Uh, uh, it's sort of, sort of like the dream team assembled uh, slowly at Softdisk. Um, one of our uh, submitters on the Apple II disc was John Carmack, and he made this cool tennis game and uh, a couple other cool games. Like, wow, he's you know pretty good. So, uh, and uh, so he was sort of in our uh, our monkey sphere of people that we'd like to get. And then our competitor, Uptime, folded. The other magazine on disc went away, and so we hired a bunch of or at least a few people from there because they had the same skill set, exactly the same skill set we needed. So we hired uh, Jay Wilbur and we hired Kevin Cloud and we hired uh, Romero. And then uh, Romero worked there. He wanted to start learning the IBM. He had been you know, doing a lot of stuff in the Apple, but thought the IBM is the new thing. I'm going to learn that. So he came there and worked on Big Blue Disc and then he wanted to sort of start up a, a monthly gaming disc and was lobbying for that. And then at the same time we had, you know, Karmic as a great submitter. So like, Hey, these two, you know, could get together and probably make some cool stuff. And we had a managing editor for the disc and stuff like that, but they didn't really get along. Like they wanted to code an assembly and get, make things really fast. And it was like, Nope, see, we have to be all and see. Cause that was, you know, he didn't know assembly. So, um, that was unfortunate, but then I, I saw that hey, they're making like real games. We were making occasional games, you know, you tiny games and stuff, but they're making like real new games. And it's like, wow, that's really cool. So I'd sneak in there after I was done with my work day to do levels and anything. Just I just want to work on this. This is so cool. 
Uh, and then they, they was like, wow, this is really worked out. We're making a good team here. Let's, you know, let's get Tom in here, you know, permanently as the uh, dude. And they wouldn't have that. It was too valuable to the Apple disc and stuff like that. And, and it's like, oh, that's too bad. And that putting us together in that same room was the, the genesis of it because, you know, it just started basically when Karma came up with the brilliant tile scrolling uh, thing for Dangerous Dave and uh, it's sort of a combination of that and me looking over we you know I had this heretical expense of having a Nintendo in the office oh my gosh uh, but I looked over and I just said wow there's Super Mario 3 wouldn't it be funny if we like did the first level of it tonight you know like oh yeah and then, so that that kind of challenge is great for, for game developer types and it's like oh yeah let's do it so I just went through and paused all the way through the level and copied all the graphics in my art. Uh, I'm making finger quotes there. Uh, uh, but, you know, I did the best good and uh, made them all have data, which, you know, Worlds of Wonder would not make you do. But <laughs> I had to enter, like, one for things that are solid and two for things that are deadly and blah, blah. Uh, and then made this in the level letter that John Romero had made called Ted. And uh, it just all came over. We just did it. I did like bad sound effects by drawing them, drawing the sound wave, which is super primitive. Uh, uh, but that's what we were doing because it was this PC speaker. And uh, I did that for the first Keens. But uh, yeah, so we just worked on, worked on, worked on. And John got things hopping on, uh, hopping on tiles and stuff, and coins flying out. And and we finished it three thirty at night. And and just put a disc, you know, put it on a disc and put it on Romero's desk and just went to bed and it was crashing and stuff. And then we came back tomorrow and he shut the door and says, we're so out of here. I've been playing this all day. And that's, that's what Romero is brilliant is seeing what you need to do next. And that was, that was just it. This is it. Let's get out of here, you know? And that's all our confluence of, uh, what we could do, just kind of all snick together in, in a good team. You know, when a lot of people talk about id and how you know far ahead of the curve they were, it seemed like they always talk about 3D stuff. But it always seemed to me like there was uh, a big leap there with the 2D games, especially with the uh, early uh, Commander Keen and uh, Dangerous Dave. Yeah, I mean, no one had done like there are other games that were you know platformers, but they if they look good, they're really slow. And like there's like there's a game called Gods or something that looked like the art was great, but the gameplay was so slow because you just couldn't move that much data. And Carmack had figured out a trick where you could move the tiles behind uh, the character with a trick in the video card because if you it was just the right size of data that it would you could keep writing and it just wrapped around in the buff so yeah, it was a very clever idea which is an awesome app and that enabled us to make a smooth scrolling keen game that was you know fast and and fun unlike anything that had been done before and it just kept rolling and and you know with wolfenstein and doom it was you know similar deal just like wow you know let's we set a goal of what of doom and we started just making little games like Hover Tank didn't have textured walls, but it was 3D and Catacombs 3D. It had it was EGA but it had textured walls, and then we finally got to do a VGA one, which is 256 colors. Woo! I went ahead and interviewed John Romero. Uh, I guess it's probably been two or three years ago. Uh, he said that the the ID was like the Beatles, and I've always wondered uh, who got you know who was uh, which Beatle. Do you? I, I guess I'd be like George Harrison. Uh, you know, like, I don't know how you'd figure that out. You know, everybody, you have to do this perfect analog. But, uh, yeah, pr I mean, probably, because I, you know, wasn't in the limelight as much as the the John and Pole. <laughs> but, you know, I had my contributions like that. I thought, I thought we made a, made a good team and made some great games. Uh, let's talk about the Commander Keen series. I know it's uh, very near and dear uh, to your heart. I uh, just for, and also uh, I just noticed this is available on Steam, so anybody watching this video can go and play those. Uh, hey. but anyway, somebody's never heard of Commander Keen before. Uh, what kind of game is this? And can you tell me about how it 
the, the story and the characters in the game? Yeah, well, basically, Commander Keen is me. Uh, except when I was a kid, I don't have, didn't have that high of an IQ. He has a 314 IQ. Uh, but I, you know, I was in red Converse sneakers and you know, grew up in Wisconsin, so I had a Packer helmet and stuff like that. And I'd sort of, you know, I'd write sci-fi stories when I was a kid. That was sort of my, you know, release. There's an old movie called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, and he just dreams of these great adventures that he'd go on, even though he's a mild-mannered person. Uh, and so seeing all these, you know, reading all these great sci-fi books and, you know, seeing all these great adventure movies, I sort of, you know, dreamt of those adventures myself and sort of combining Star Wars and Star Trek and Hitchhiker's A Guide to the Galaxy and Warner Brothers, all my influences, that just kind of came out. Uh, we, we decided to do a scrolling game ourselves, and uh, Carmack said, I don't know, because I, you know, I always have like a bazillion ideas. It's almost hard to narrow them down. So I said, I don't know, a kid that saves the galaxy or something. So I just went off, and in 15 minutes, you know, I, I came up with the paragraph you read in the first game that, you know, just Commander Keen. Uh, and then uh, read it to him in sort of a Walter Winchell or movie announcer voice. And then so I said, dispenses galactic justice with an iron hand. And then, and then after it, Carmack applauded and was like, oh, yeah, that's it. You know, so and then we just rolled with it. Uh, so Keen is this little kid, Billy Blaze. He's eight years old. Uh, and he has uh, assembled a starship. Uh, in his backyard clubhouse secretly and he's he takes off on galactic adventures to sort of he sort of trans so trans uh sorry he <laughs> it's really morning he becomes this character commander keen to dispense justice and he you know has a lot of his first adventures on mars and he travels to various planets and stuff like that and it's a platform game and you have like a little ray gun and a pogo stick and stuff like that and you just go through uh these levels and encounter these wacky these cartoonish uh over the top creatures uh in fact sort of uh the creature in the first game the garg was sort of a representation of the id in the psyche it's just sort of it just hungers and it wants to go towards things it likes and go away from things it doesn't like you know and or destroy things it doesn't like so it was kind of manifestation of it itself and uh so he goes on lots of adventures to in outer space and then he always comes back and has to you know be secretive about what he's done sort of like men in black he like one time he almost gets caught by his parents so he kind of quickly neural stuns them and then puts them back on the kitchen table and so I don't know what happened you know <laughs> that kind of thing like men in black um, but uh, yeah he's just a, just a good natured guy with a little smart alecky attitude often and he just goes on these bold exciting adventures how successful were these games uh, they, well I mean when we made the first one, we kind of moonlighted off our day jobs and made the first one. And at first month, sold $10,000, which is you know huge back then. It was like, we could live on that. And that was what let us think, hey, we could actually make a company out of this. And uh, so, I mean, it sold crazy well. And then Wolfenstein told, sold 10 times as much and then doom sold 10 times as much as that so that was just sort of hop skip and a jump and if you're forming a game company we put as much money as we could back into the company after we got a decent success so we could keep that rolling so we could keep our entity alive rather than you know just we we got lots of money oh no, can't do anything anymore so. what's up with the dope fish the dope fish okay the dope fish uh, in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Guide, the stupidest creature in the world is the bug bladder beast of Troll. And uh, it's so stupid that it thinks that if you can't see it, it can't see you. So you wrap a towel around your head and then it goes, oh, where, where'd he go? Uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. And that was just a hilarious concept to me. So uh, I was drawing a bunch of these creatures you know creature ideas for keen and i draw this i was like i'm just gonna make a stupid fish just really stupid like really dumb and so i just drew this big buck teeth and you're like, like sort of like the warner brothers you know 
goofy, not that intelligent characters. And, uh, and uh, I just had him swim through a level. And it was just a one off in a level. So he just swims through a level, tries to eat you. You can distract it by having little fish follow you and having it eat those fish. And then it just for the dumb old comic move, uh, once he eats something, he turns to on the screen and just burps. So uh, Warner Brothers cartoons, the characters always do a take and break the fourth wall towards the viewer and do something, you know? So that was, that was, that character's take was just burping and it was funny cause that was coming out and stuff. And I thought, well, as a funny little character in that one level. And then for some reason, people just took to that character and loved it so much. They like wanted to hide it in other games. And, and there's like, I don't know how many games, if you go to dopefish.com, it's been in so many games. It's kind of funny. Um, uh, and we wanted to hide it ourselves in a game when I was at 3D Realms. And uh, Jay said, uh, you know, it's cool as long as it's not a main character. So we just sent a mail back saying, use the fish. And sort of let everybody use that as a as a little secret in all the games. And it's, it's been fun. I mean, I've hit it in all the games I've done uh, that I can have that much control over. And, uh, and it's just fun to see it. I mean, someone actually went to the trouble of becoming a priest of the church of the dopey fish. They're actually you know, like a minister in that church of, you know, I was wondering if that would make you the, the Pope of the dope fish. I, I'm a lot nicer to, uh, our younger people. I hope, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd rather not be the Pope. I just want to make cool games, you know? That's all for this week's episode. Hope to see you guys next week with a part two of this interview with Mr. Tom Hall. Lots of great stuff coming up, including uh, Wolfenstein 3D and the later games from id. So stay tuned. A lot of great stuff. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much. If you have supported me on Patreon or by using uh, good old games, affiliates, or however, or just spreading the word about the shows on Twitter and Facebook. I really appreciate it, guys. I really, really do. If you want to become a supporter on Patreon, just go to the link in the show notes, and that will get you access to some uh, little extras, extra episodes of Rat Chat. You can hang out with me on Google, uh, Google Air, and you can also catch some uh, really cool things, like we just finished interviewing uh, Lucas Kubiak of the uh, developer of the Kulot game that just got greenlit on Steam. A little survival horror adventure thing. Uh, it was really cool, really fun interview, but uh, those are only available to the Patreon supporters. But at any level, a dollar an episode, five dollars, whatever, you think the show is worth, I am happy to be supported by you. So thanks. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, several interesting things have happened lately. Uh, Thimblewood... Th Thimbleweed Park. Uh, this is a Kickstarter launched by Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick. Of course, you know those names of fa very famous Lucasfilm uh, adventure game designers. Uh, they are trying to raise 375k. They've already, with I think it's only been five days, are already up to 325k. So doing really well. I'd be stunned if this thing didn't make. It's probably going to get you know get well into stretch goals and what's interesting here is they're taking a very um, old school approach i think they might actually be using the scum engine but anyway it looks like they are uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see what what they're doing with that i think the goal as i understand it is to make a game that feels like a lucasfilm games uh from the uh from the, the past that you somehow missed now you have a brand new one uh, to play so that's a, that's a really fun uh idea and i guess it's taking off but anyway go, go check that out uh, there's another Kickstarter called Convoy. I, I, I've supported this one. I don't know if I've mentioned it on the show before, but this is a tactical roguelike like. Basically, it's a mashup of the FTL game with a Mad Max theme to it. Uh, they're trying to raise 10,000 euros. Uh, they've already gotten close to double that, so go check that out. It's only got a few days left on that. And then, uh, yeah, I think that's actually all the news from the, the Matt Cave. So. What about the Ale of the Week? Well, this week, you know, as we're getting a little closer to Christmas time, we start to get these uh, holiday specials, these holiday-themed uh, ales in the shops. Uh, this is a holiday spice lager beer uh, from the Lakefront Brewery. Lake Front Brewery. <laughs> Can't talk today. Out of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
And this is lager beer brewed with honey, cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, cloves, and orange peel. So lots of uh, spices going in. Almost sounds like a uh, like a pumpkin pie or something. Uh, brewed and bottled by Lakefront Brewery. Let's see, is there anything else on the bottle? Brewed in Milwaukee for people who like beer. Uh, let's see. Oh, 9.4% alcohol. So very strong indeed. That's about twice what you would expect from most uh, most macro brews. So this will probably pack quite a punch. Anyway, it's Sounds kind of interesting. Let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this holiday spice here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it. It's uh, kind of it smells like a pumpkin ale, actually. I guess that's the they must have used the same sort of seasonings. You can definitely smell the cinnamon. A little bit of a of a champagne-like uh, scent to it. It's quite nice, uh, you know, actually quite quite a nice aroma to it. Uh, let's give it a taste. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can definitely taste a the wang uh, to this. Uh, not sure about the spices quite yet. You can definitely, it smells, I'm amazed this doesn't have pumpkin in it because it just tastes and smells exactly like those pumpkin ales that I've had. There's a bit of another taste in there. Uh, must be the cloves. You know, you can tell there's something unusual uh, with the taste of this. Let me try it again. It's very sort of bitter at first and then it gets uh, really sweet all of a sudden. Uh, you can definitely taste some alcohol, <laughs> you know, in this. Uh, Kind of reminds me a little bit of a of a scotch. Try it one more time here. How to describe that? It's uh, it's not bad. You you definitely taste the the bitterness going down. A bit of a sort of raisiny I like taste to it. Nice and thick, uh, creamy. <laughs> also quite strong. So definitely would want to. Uh, Enjoy this over the, you know, this is a sipping ale, okay? <laughs> Not a chugger. But anyway, uh, what to give it? I mean, I'm not going to say it's my favorite beer of all time. I mean, let's go with a four out of five drinking horns, I think, does it justice. A cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger. I think it must be the nutmeg I'm tasting here. But uh, very sweet, kind of bitter, very strong. Uh, <laughs> you know, actually, I, I think I've I think I've nailed it. So it's it's like you took a a pumpkin ale and then poured some a uh, Jägermeister in there, <laughs> kind of like a Jägermeister meets ale beverage. But anyway, it's not bad, not great. Uh, four out of five, I think, uh, does it. So I was looking for quotations about or, or from rather George Harrison, since uh, Tom said that he he feels like the George Harrison of the id Beatles, if you will. And I thought this was, uh, you know, strangely appropriate. Uh, you know, let me know what you think. Uh, so here it goes. I wanted to be successful, not famous. See you guys next week. Good morning, men and women. Welcome. I am your friendly courier. Mr. Blood Vessel is my name. Buster, blood vessel. I am concerned for you to enjoy yourselves within the limits of British decency.